when you do join a media team, it's very much like working in a newsroom. No day is the same. You have to respond to things hour by hour because things are always changing. COVID-19 was the perfect example. No one really knew what to do with it. Uh, so I was lucky enough to be a part of a task force with Transport for New South Wales that was pulled together. And myself and three other people led a media response for almost 12 months. And we had to be really dynamic in our response, not only adhering to what we need to do for traditional media like newspapers, television and radio, we also need to think about our social audience because we know people are looking there. So why not get the information there so they can also use it. I thought I'd give my honours degree a go. I did a thesis. I still learnt I really love to write, but I didn't want to be a journalist. Someone actually brought the Transport for New South Wales graduate program to my attention. So I applied. I was lucky enough to get a spot there and be put in a couple of media teams. And now I've found what I want to do and I'm really enjoying it. On the ferry here. The sky is the limit and Western Sydney University is really, really going to set you up well for all of the options out there, particularly the journalism degree. You never know what possibilities could come from it. There are many other vocations out there. You could be doing media for a major corporation. You could be doing media for a major government department. You could be doing PR for a major fashion label. You just don't know what could happen. I think the most memorable experience for me was my first trip to Syria. I had spent five years reporting on Australian men and women who had gone to join groups like Islamic State. It wasn't until I got there and we arrived at a processing area in the desert and started to talk to these women. It changed me as a person. Over three days, 10,000 women and children come out of the dust from Baghuz, the final holdout of ISIS. I was able to tell the story of Maria Exposto, who was a romance scam victim targeted by an international drug syndicate and was on death row. We spent months analysing court documents and infiltrating secret WhatsApp groups to understand how those international drug syndicates operated. After our story went to air, she was released and sent back to Australia, so that was quite incredible to be involved in that. I think there will always be uh, a value in journalists. What we do is incredibly important to democracy. We are seeing the media world change through the digital age, through the existence of social media platforms. I think that the media will continue to adapt and find new ways to tell our stories. But at the core of what we do as journalists, that won't change. You know, it's still important to hold the powerful to account. Investigative journalism, you know, is more important than ever, particularly, you know, with uh, the distrust of, of the public against the media. Um, what we do isn't easy, but, but it's important. It's important to democracy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm welcome to this uh, signature uh, journalism event. Uh, I'm a pro Associate Professor Matt McGuire, um, and I'm the Dean of the School of Humanities and Communication Arts um, here at Western Sydney University. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to Acton Pro Vice Chancellor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education, Strategy and Consultation um, at Western Sydney University, uh, Fiona Tiny. Um, who's going to deliver for us the welcome to country. Hello everyone. Arranging a welcome to country or an acknowledgement of country shows a respect for Aboriginal people as Australia's first peoples. Welcome to country is undertaken by an Aboriginal person who, who hails from the people of this area, that is the Darug Nation. Like Suzanne, I am from the Wiradjuri Nation, from the central west of New South Wales. I'm not entitled to deliver a welcome of country on Darug land. I can, however, undertake an acknowledgement of country, which I will do now. I would like to acknowledge the Baramadigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, of the Darug Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous people here today. When I'm asked to acknowledge country, I usually ponder the topic at hand. Today, that is journalism. I have a report that was published in 2018, a paper, sorry, 
um, Art Diversity Arts Australia published a res resource for the media core reporting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and issues. An extract of the introduction of this doc document says, whether deliberate or unconscious, those working in the media have the power to influence how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are perceived and understood. Inaccurate or inflammatory reporting from a position of power can have a detrimental impact on an already oppressed community. Journalists should take the time to reflect on their own views, biases and opinions about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and use facts and editorial judgment to challenge rather than reinforce stereotypes. Some years ago, an ideal, idealistic young doctor called Fiona Stanley collected new, uh, newspaper articles about Aboriginal health for one year and found that 90% of them were negative. It was, she thought, proof of the media's inherent racism. Now heading the Telethon Institute for Child Health Research, which employs many Aboriginal researchers, Stanley remains angry about what she sees as the unrelenting negative coverage and the sense of hopelessness it engenders among individuals and policy makers within the broader community. She says there is mounting evidence from work at her institute and elsewhere in the world that Indigenous children's self-esteem, resilience and educational outcomes depend on how they believe the dominant culture perceives their culture. The more that the dominant culture reports negative stories about Aboriginal people, the more that Aboriginal children feel bad about being Aboriginal, says Stanley. Stanley goes on to say, I have these fantasy conversations with Rupert Mur Murdoch, can you believe it? And I say, you could actually turn around Aboriginal people if you could change the way you report, even if you just made 50% of your articles positive. You could even reduce suicide rates. But winning coverage for the positive stories is an uphill struggle, says Stanley, even for someone with her public profile. Given that, I would like to share some success stories about Indigenous staff, students and communities from Western Sydney University and Greater Western Sydney. Focusing on Western Sydney University, in 2021 we have approximately 750 Indigenous students enrolled across 18 institutes and schools. Over the last 15 years, our enrolments for Indigenous students have increased by 216%. One third of our current students are enrolled in nursing, midwifery, teaching, law and Doctor of Medicine courses. Our postgraduate and PhD student numbers are increasing every year. Our commencing and, con and continuing enrolments increase every year. For 2021, those numbers increased by more than 10% over last year's numbers. We have a team supporting students across all campuses. This is the Badanami team working out of each of the Badanami Centres for Indigenous Education. Western also has a publication called The Yarning Circle. This quarterly journal celebrates Indigenous excellence in Western Sydney and beyond. The media officer who co coordinates publication is one of our young Indigenous students cur currently studying her Masters of Education. Incidentally, she's a straight HD student. This mag magazine is freely available online. Additionally, I would be happy to add you to our mailing list if you would like to be included in our um, paper post out. You will find stories such as competitive scholarship recipients, one of our female students who played in the Indigenous All-Stars team this year and last, another who was recently awarded Young Woman of the West Award, students of ours who have been nominated the Channel 7 Young Achiever Awards, newly appointed Indigenous senior academics, Indigenous alumni, Indigenous researchers, Indigenous pathway programs for primary and secondary students. Well, I'm sure you get the picture. I can assure you that if you are looking for some po positive stories in relation to Indigenous peoples and communities, you have come to the right place. Finally, I would like to remind you that you are meeting on Indigenous lands today, continuing the tradition of coming together to share knowledges that has occurred on these lands for tens of thousands of years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona. Before I do my official bit, I just would like to say two things. Um, you can probably tell from uh, listening to me that, that I'm not from around here. Um, I'm from Queensland. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But one of the things that um, I truly appreciate about um, living in Australia is whenever we get together to do something like this, to share stories uh, and to listen to stories, is to remember that we are taking part in a process that's been happening here for almost 70,000 years. And we're just the very small latest iteration of that 
of that narrative. Um, it's tremendously powerful. Um, yeah, that, that was the main thing I wanted to, to share. I've forgotten what the second part was. Um, so anyway, let me get on with the official proceedings. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome um, some special guests um, in the audience today. Um, they are Andrea Ho, uh, the Director of Education from the Judith Nielsen Institute. Um, Marcus Rao, um, the Events and Programme Coordinator at the Walkley Foundation for Journalism. Uh, Rowan Tomes, um, Head of Strategy at Appboxer, um, who is also um, a graduate of our music programme, a quick plug for the university. Um, and journalists from the ABC Parramatta Bureau, uh, Julia Federi, uh, Flip Pryor, um, and Gada Ali. Uh, we also have among us our esteemed academic colleagues and professional staff from diverse areas of the university um, and some former academics who taught our two guest speakers uh, not too long ago. Um, oh, this was the second thing I was going to say. For our undergraduates, this is the room that we use for graduations. Okay? And I think it's a real... So what normally happens is all the academics are here dressed like Harry Potter, the vice chancellors at the front, and the students all line up here and they come up across the stage, their family all clap, and they get their scroll and, and get their photograph taken with the vice chancellor. And I think it's a tremendous testament to the caliber of the former students that we're about to hear from uh, today that, um, that they are now standing on this stage and they're now addressing an audience in, in, in this room. That was my second point. Um, a special welcome also to the families um, of our guest speakers who are with us today. So, who have we got? Um, our first speaker for today is Suzanne Dredge, a three times Walkley award winner uh, and senior multi-platform producer with ABC Investigations. From next month, her title changes to Supervising Producer for Investigations, Regional and Indigenous Affairs at the ABC's flagship nightly current affairs show, 7.30. Our second speaker is Brogan Anlazark, a Government and Cluster Relations Program Manager for Transport for New South Wales. Brogan graduated from Western Sydney University with a Bachelor of Communications Honours in 2014, and in 2015 she began her career as a Corporate Communications graduate. Two years later she was appointed Senior Media Officer for Roads and Maritime Services. Brogan finds and shares stories of Transport for New South Wales, which is one of the largest New South Wales government agencies. Her work ranges from organising media events for the Prime Minister of Australia to film in the installation of key transport infrastructure in the dead of night. Can you please join me in welcoming Suzanne Dredge and Brogan Anozark. Hello. That makes me sound very important. <laughs> Um, thank you for having me here today. It feels very strange to be back at Western Sydney University and talking about my career. I hope my story inspires you and helps you achieve a career in the media. When Dr Asher Chand first invited me to speak to current students, I thought I'd be sitting in a classroom talking casually about journalism and navigating my career in the media. Since it's turned into a much bigger event, I've decided to share my whole story and talk about the challenges I had to overcome to get to where I am today. It's the first time I've chosen to share my story publicly. It is raw and confronting, but I hope it inspires you and motivates you to become strong leaders in the future. My pathway to university was unconventional and different to most journalists working in the industry. 13 years ago, I was 27 years old, standing in front of the lecture theatre at Warrington campus, thrilled to be the first person in my family attending university. My father didn't go to school and never learnt to read or write. My mother raised four children in Department of Housing as a single mother and worked at the local turkey factory to make ends meet. It's making me emotional, look at you, Mum. <laughs> I didn't have the same opportunities as other young people my age, and as a young Aboriginal woman growing up in a low socioeconomic area, this system was against me. I left school in year 10, moved out of home at 16, and thought I knew everything. At the age of 18, I was a teenage mother. By the time I turned 23, I had three little boys and found myself living in a domestic violence relationship. The statistics weren't in my favour. 
That same year, two young mothers in my community were murdered at the hands of their partners. By the time I was 24, I wondered whether I would make it out of my relationship alive. The last time I was assaulted, I drove to the police station with a fractured eye socket and swollen eye. The police escorted me back to my house and arrested my ex-partner. They gave me four hours to pack my belongings and leave because after that time, he would be released with an AVO. I knew it wouldn't keep me safe. I bundled my boys into the car and drove to my mother's home. It was the first time I'd been honest about what I'd been going through, hiding the domestic violence from my family for many years because I was ashamed that I found myself in that position. But something changed in me that day. As I drove away from the house, I felt the weight of the world lift from my shoulders. It was replaced with a determination to break the cycle and provide a better life for me and my children. I knew from that moment, nothing would hold me back. With the love and support of family, I began to rebuild my life by enrolling into TAFE to study youth work. I started working in marginalised communities and found myself surrounded by injustice. I witnessed young Aboriginal men put in jail for minor offences minor offenses at the age of 10 years old. In one community, the juvenile detention centre was next door to the local, local primary school and across the road from the high school. Young people and their families were living in severe poverty. They would come to us hungry and reveal they were living in homes with no electricity. Drug and alcohol abuse plagued the area and no one seemed to care. Every single one of those families had their own stories to tell. They were completely forgotten about and the cycle of abuse continued. In the back of my mind was the voice of a 12-year-old girl who used to dream about becoming a journalist and exposing the injustice surrounding me. If I didn't stand up and tell their stories, who would? Feeling motivated, I made the decision to enrol at Western Sydney University to study journalism as a mature age student. A lot of people had strong opinions about my decision. I was too old to become a journalist and there's no way I would get a job in the industry. But their opinions didn't affect me. I believed in myself and knew nothing was impossible with hard work and dedication. I am now a multi-platform producer with the ABC's investigative unit, a multiple award-winning journalist, and, if, as, and as of next week, I will be the new supervising producer of investigations, regional and indigenous affairs with the ABC's flagship current affairs show, 7.30. I've been really lucky in my career and it all started here at Western Sydney University. It took a lot to enrol as a mature age student with a Year 10 certificate. Thanks to the help and support of Baden Army, I was accepted into a Bachelor of Communication, majoring in journalism. Quite quickly, I realised enrolling at university was the easy part. Getting through a degree as a single mother with a full-time job was going to be the challenge. But I was excited to be here and determined to make it. This university gave me the building blocks that helped shape me into the journalist I am today. None of it would have been possible without the support of lecturers like Dr. Asha Chand, Barbara Alson, David Cubby, and the former head of school, Lynette Sheridan Burns. They were all incredible leaders with their own impressive careers in the industry and wanted me to succeed. They would allow my children to accompany me to class so I wouldn't fall behind in my studies. Some days it was a struggle to turn up. I worked night shift so I could study during the day, operating on no sleep. There were times when I had no money and couldn't afford to pay for parking, ending up with hundreds of dollars of fees. I could barely afford to pay for petrol, let alone the exorbitant parking fees. I was struggling, but I loved being here and learning from the lecturers at the university. The very first day of my degree, Barbara Alson told us to start looking for internships and pitching story ideas to the local paper. Dr. Asha Chand told us to volunteer at community radio stations and to apply for work experience to start building a portfolio. I listened and paid attention to every word they said. One of our assessments was pitching a story idea to the editor of a local newspaper. I started doing that in year one and not long after had my first front page story in the MacArthur Advertiser. By second year, Heather Forbes, a representative from the ABC, was invited to talk to students about applying for cadetships. 
there were only 12 allocated per year and thousands of journalism students across the country applied. Barbara told us to come prepared and warned, do not ask how much money you're going to earn. That will show you're not interested in journalism and she will not take you seriously. I'd never met anyone that worked at the ABC and I knew she would have valuable knowledge about working in the media. After her presentation, someone put their hand up and asked, how much money does a journalist earn? <laughs> it was a wasted opportunity and a valuable lesson to listen to the lecturers. By the end of the session, I asked a series of questions about journalism and working in a newsroom. Barbara introduced us and, rec and recommended me as a potential candidate. Heather gave me her email address, told me to stay in touch and promised to alert me to future internships. The first thing I did was go to the library and sent her an email with my details. So by the time she arrived back at the office, it was sitting in her inbox. It showed determination and leadership. A few months later, she sent me a contract in the mail, offering me a 12-month internship, study support, and the opportunity to work in the newsroom during semester break. That was the beginning of my career at the ABC. I continued to work hard and take on other roles. Two years into my degree, I was an ABT intern and a producer at Koori Radio, building my career and portfolio. What the ABC didn't know at the time was I was a single mother. A few months into my internship, the Chief of Staff asked why I enrolled at university in my late 20s. I told him about my children and what drove me to take this path. He was shocked and impressed. Heather Forbes called me into her office and asked why I didn't tell her about my situation. My response, if you knew I was a young mother, you would have assumed I couldn't do it. She agreed and vowed to do everything in her power to help me succeed in the industry. And that's exactly what she did. At the end of the internship, Heather recommended me to Joe Pacini, who was the editor of the National Reporting Team, a new unit set up to provide original content and investigative stories across multiple platforms at the ABC. Two months into the job, there were reports of an Australian man who had become a suicide bomber in Syria. I was tasked with finding out who he was and how he got there. It took me a week to find out his name and background. I also ended up uncovering a network of other Australians who had recently tra travelled to Syria to fight with rebel groups. That was the start of multiple stories over the next few years that eventually led to the award-winning program Orphans of ISIS. In 2015, a Middle East correspondent, Matt Brown, asked me to work on a story about a group of Yazidi women who had allegedly been enslaved by Australian citizens in Syria. Our team tracked the women down in a refugee camp and verified claims they had been held as sexual slaves by well-known jihadists, Mohammed Elmar and Khalid Sharif. While working on that story, the Yazidi women gave us a mobile phone containing intimate images of Khalid Sharif's wife and children. For two years, both men were the most prolific Australians fighting for the Islamic State. During that time, Sharif's mother-in-law, Karen Nettleton, had been hounded by the media and blamed for helping her daughter and grandchildren escape the country. Journalists camped outside her house on and off for months. She had never spoken to the media and had a distrust for journalists. After obtaining the images and finding out Sharif's wife helped them escape, my gut was telling me there was more to the story that hadn't been told. The day after the interviews with the Yazidi women yet aired on 7.30, I knocked on Karen's door and offered to show her the images on my iPad. I expected her to tell me to go away, but to my surprise, she invited me inside. I was the first journalist she trusted to enter her home. For two hours, I sat and listened. I didn't ask for anything and never pressured her to do an interview. I was focused on building trust and rapport by allowing her to talk openly off the record. We stayed in contact and a few months later, she invited me to have lunch with her lawyer. During that meeting, they informed me Karen was planning on traveling to Turkey to rescue her grandchildren. Her daughter had recently died from health complications and there were reports Sharif had been killed in a drone strike. They asked me to document her journey saying, we trust you we trust you to tell this story fairly and accurately. Knowing I couldn't do it alone, I approached my colleague Dylan, Wert, Dylan Welch to work with me. That was the start of a five-year journey to film Karen's attempts to save her grandchildren from the clutches of Islamic State. 
Karen Nettleton's story and that of the Sharif orphans is one of the world's best known and most sought after stories of the rise and fall of Islamic State. Other than requesting a news bite, no other journalist had provided her an opportunity to talk and find out what was really going on. It's a perfect example of going behind the daily headlines and taking the, the story further. In 2018, our team had filmed Karen's multiple failed attempts at rescuing her grandchildren. The Islamic State was losing ground and it was evident that it would all come to an end within the next six months. I started making contacts on the ground in Syria and used Twitter to contact fixers, aid workers and anyone who was there reporting on the war. At this stage, Karen had lost contact with her grandchildren and there was a possibility they had been killed. I followed daily updates and kept in contact with Kurdish journalists, hoping that they would have some kind of information. In early 2019, I found a Christian aid worker posting videos and images of ISIS families living in Baghuz, the last ISIS stronghold. They were waiting for a, for a humanitarian corridor to open up for families to leave. If the Sharif children were alive, he would be the first person to make contact. We talked on the phone late at night and I asked him to film any Australians who escaped Baghuz. A few days later, he sent me a video of the first Australian woman to flee the terrorist group. Her name was Zara Duman. After receiving the video, the ABC sent me to Iraq to meet up with Middle Eastern correspondent Adam Harvey and cameraman Tom Hancock. We crossed the border into Syria via a small pontoon bridge across the Euphrates River, hoping to find Zara and any other Australians who had been captured by Kurdish forces. Spending months building those relationships really paid off. Our team ended up with a network of people we could rely on to take us straight to the story. A few days into our trip, the fixer told us we were going to the Abu Omar oil field. That would be our base, which would allow us to get to the front line of Baghuz. Hundreds of ISIS men, women and children had started fleeing and were taken to a processing centre in the middle of the desert. At the time, only Kurdish journalists were allowed to film in the area. I spoke to my contacts and convinced them to send us with them. That negotiation not only got our team to the processing area, but it allowed every other Western journalist the same access. Again, it was a good example of working your contacts and building relationships with people covering stories you were working on long term. For five hours, we travelled along desert roads past small towns with ISIS supporters. Locals called it the cannonball run. The aim was to get out of there as quickly as possible because the risk to foreign journalists was too high. We were worth a lot of money if captured. Upon arriving at the processing area, the sound of screaming children stung my ears as I stepped out of the van to look at the scene in front of me. Thousands of women and children had emerged from the cattle trucks, clutching onto the last of their belongings. Most of them were injured and extremely malnourished. No one understood how many people were left behind. Every day, the humanitarian corridor was extended to give them the opportunity to leave. I'm going to show you some of the 7.30 story that we put to air um, and a video diary that I was making on my phone. Many of the children are sick. They're malnourished and exhausted. There's little help for them here. They must be taken to a refugee camp six hours drive north on the back of a truck. David, what's happened to her? Uh, she's been shot and looks like a while ago. The only first aid is from an American volunteer whose small team is overwhelmed. Well, we have all injuries. People have been shot for two months with external fixation. A lady, leg blown off, and you could, it was like, a, like an anatomy class. And she'd been taking care of it. Her daughter had been taking care of it for one month, and she wasn't dead. We have food coming, but none right now. But I have milk that your kids can have. Would that work? This woman came to ISIS from Finland. She has four children with her. Living without food. There are lots of bombing. You can see people die in, your, in front of you. And uh, children dying and injured. Um, like whole village burning. Yeah. Like, horrible. Amongst the desperation, 
There's defiance. بإذن الله ما تنتهي لأن الله إن شاء الله ينصرهم ويثبتهم لأن هم على الحق ما سووا شيء خطأ لأنه كل لباس شرعي وإسلام ويتعاملون البشر بأخلاق ويعني بكل شيء يتعاملون وياه أحسن هذا اللبس هذا الجيد هذا اللبس جيد هذا اللبس مو جيد يلا طلعوا طلع الهاي طلعها يلا عليش ما طلعها This Iraqi woman is talking about our producer Suzanne She's offended by her jeans and baggy jumper طب هلا هي بنظرة كافرة مو كافر أنا ما كفر ما يصير أكفرها أنا الله أعلم لا يعلم الغيب إلا الله بس بنظر إنه هذا اللبس مو صحيح هذا اللبس طريق للنار إن شاء الله هذا طريق للجنة So I'm currently at the processing centre just past Bagus there are thousands of women and children here who have fled IS some of them are wounded um, there are a lot of sick children crying. There are still more women and children to come. The SDF has gone down to ship them out in a truck. Some people won't make it. Others will go to camps and join over 100,000 people already there. A lot of foreign women are here today. Um, most of them don't want to speak on camera. And some of them are offended by the way I look because I'm not in a nakab. It's quite a confronting situation. All up, we spent over a week and a half in Syria. And the day we left, I received a phone call informing me that Karen's grandchildren were alive and had just arrived in a camp. It was too late for us to turn around and go back. So upon returning to Sydney, we found out Karen was planning to go to Syria to find her grandchildren at the Al Hall detention camp. She was going with or without us. After five years of filming her journey, we would finally have an ending. So seven days later, I was on a plane traveling back to Syria with Dylan Welch and cameraman Dave McGuire to film Karen reuniting her, with her grandchildren. Um, I'm gonna play you the promo because it's a 60 minute film. For those that haven't seen it, I will provide links. I'm 
missed you too, baby. I missed you too. Oh my god, how are you going? <laughs> this is what I've been waiting for. Just this feeling, you know? Just this, this, God, this. Five years, two months. Everybody knows I'm here to get you out, but it's just going to take a little time. It's not going to be long at all. It's not going to be like a month or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> It'll take a few days. A few days, okay? A few days. At the end of the project, we had over 40 hours of footage consisting of interviews, trips to the Middle East, and the death of Karen's daughter and two grandsons. While we were in the camp filming Karen, I met a group of Australian women in nearby tents. I knew who some of them were because of the stories we'd worked on previously. Realising quite quickly they had their own stories to tell, I convinced them to let me sit inside the tent and talk. By the end, they gave me their names and phone numbers of their families back in Australia. That was the start of Married to Islamic State. It took three months to convince the families to go on camera and tell their stories. You have to understand that this is a community who is very fearful of the media and the Australian public. They needed to trust that we wouldn't sensationalise their stories, but we would investigate the claims and how they got there. By the end, we realised most of the women were related by birth or marriage, and it appeared to be one big family network orchestrated by one person. That was Mohammed Zahab. Mohammed Zahab was a senior Islamic State leader who had risen through the ranks of the terrorist group, all the while managing to remain hidden from public view. A few months later, we travelled back to Syria with two representatives of the families who both had daughters and grandchildren in the camp. When we arrived, we found dozens of Australian women and children sweltering in the 50 degree heat. The children's state was particularly disturbing. Some were severely malnourished and suffer suffering with dysentery. Others had burns and untreated bullet wounds. There was little to no medical care, hardly any food and only a small amount of unpleasantly warm water. It was clear the kids were suffering. Most of them were born in Syria, into a situation they didn't choose and unsure if they'd ever make it home. As of today, they are still in the camp waiting on the Australian government to make a decision to repatriate, where they will either be prosecuted or put on control orders in the community. I think I've gone over time, so um, I'll just end with what we do is more important, as journalists, is more important than ever. We have communities who once trusted the media turning away to alternative sources to get their news, often sources that are full of conspiracy theories and false information. It is so important to democracy that we continue to hold the powerful to account, expose injustice and work towards a fair and just society. As newsrooms become smaller, the media will continue to evolve and find new ways to create engaging content. You are at the beginning of your journey, so make it count and understand why you want to work in the media. Start building your CV from day one, listen to the advice of your lecturers, and develop strong skills in pitching stories. Attend networking events and expand your contact list. Don't wait until third year to start thinking about the direction you want to take. Thank you for having me. I hope it's in, helped inspire you to dream big and work hard. If there's one message you take away, it's this. Believe in yourself, particularly when others don't. Embrace the hardship because it helps shape you into a strong, determined person with thick skin. And believe me, you will need it working in the media industry. Surround yourself with a supportive network of friends and family who will help get you through your degree. I hope to see you guys working alongside me in the future. Thank you for having me and allowing me to share my story. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne, um, for sharing your own story. Um, and for giving us all a lesson in how to investigate and how to tell stories that really matter. Um, I particularly liked the bit at the start where she spoke about, Suzanne spoke about how she got her own internship, and I think she's going to get
back to work tomorrow and find 200 emails in her inbox um, from people introducing themselves to her, um, which is great. Um, I'd like to bring up now our second speaker who's going to share um, her remarkable story with you. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Brogan Anlazark. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like Suzanne mentioned, I also thought I was going to be in a classroom and we we're all going to be sitting down. Um, so please bear with me while I try and get through this. Just listening to Suzanne's story was just amazing and inspiring and a great reflection of what you can all be. So please join me in giving her another round of applause. To start with, I'd like to thank Dr Chan for inviting me here today to talk to you. She has been a really pivotal part of my university journey and there are a lot of things that you're about to hear that I couldn't have done without her direction. I am proudly Western Sydney born and bred and there was never a question about where I was going to go to university. When I did my degree, I was based at the Warrington South campus and the facilities were just amazing. The flexibility the university provides is also a draw card, so I'm happy to see so many of you here today. Like Matt mentioned, I graduated in this very auditorium in 2013 with a Bachelor of Communication majoring in Journalism, and again in 2014 with a Bachelor of Communication Honours. It's so great to be back here and see there's still such a great interest in journalism and all of the associated vocations. You'll hear me talk a lot about persistence, diversity and agility. I'd like you to keep these traits in mind as you hear me talk and hear my story and my journey to where I am today. I do have a little bit of a confession to make. I wanted to drop out of university after my first year. It was a massive change. I came straight from high school. Uh, it was a big shock to the system and I wasn't quite getting what I thought out of it. The first semester was great. I did my introduction to journalism subject and I thought, yes, this is exactly what I want to do. But as you know, you go into your second semester and you do have to do the foundational subjects and you might not want to do them and that's exactly how I felt. It's not until many years later I realised how important those subjects are because they do open a whole world that you never would have thought about. I was ready to give it all up and I truly felt that it was the best decision for me. Looking back now, and from the guidance from my amazing mum, I persevered, and if she didn't push me to stay and study, I wouldn't be here talking to all of you today. I didn't realise it at the time, but the foundational subjects are a key part of why I wanted to be at Western Sydney University. There weren't many other degrees around that offered that sort of variation. I'm sharing this particular experience today because some of you might be feeling like that right now and that's absolutely okay. But I do want you to know you should be, keep on going and see what's out there. Second and third year is where I really found my stride. I absolutely loved the rest of my degree. I had the opportunity to focus on great subjects like feature writing and also the practical subjects like television journalism and radio journalism, which Barbara Aylison so kindly taught me to hone my craft. There's nothing better than getting out there with a camera with your community and seeing what stories you can find. I really got to sink my teeth into what it means to be a journalist and all of the great skills that come with it. During my second year, a, pa a practical opportunity came up and I was proud to be selected as one of the presenters for Local Loop, a program that was produced by TVS at the time by communication students. This was my real first taste of television journalism and learning the ins and outs of the process was just amazing. Being selected as one of the presenters was terrifying, but an overall great experience because it challenged me to start thinking about which direction I wanted to take my career in. If there is one message I want all of you to take away today, it is to go for every opportunity available. I second Suzanne's comments about internships and pushing for everything you can. Getting out of the classroom and taking on an internship is a great way to learn what to do and it may just change the course of your path. 
I was persistent and wanted to experience everything journalism had to offer and what a newsroom had to offer, so I put my name down for every single opportunity that came my way. I'm sure Dr Chand and Barbara Aylison were sick to death of seeing my name in their inbox, but there I was, putting my hand up for everything. I ended up applying for a number of internships, including at the ABC, SBS, the then Fairfax Media, and I ended up at Woman's Day for 12 months, simply the fact that they needed help for one day, and I put my hand up and I said, can I come and help you three times a week for the rest of the year? And they said yes. So there I was, three times a week, in the Park Street office at Woman's Day. I felt like such a grown-up, interacting with journalists, writing my own copy and stories, recording radio grabs for the hourly bulletins, learning how to write in different styles. I could go on forever. Doing these internships was the best decision I made because I quickly realised I didn't want to be a journalist. The newsrooms were amazing and all of the journalists guiding me were incredible, but it just wasn't the environment for me. To this day, I still can't put my finger on what it was, but I had a gut feeling and I had to go with it. You can't knock something until you try it. So I would strongly encourage all of you to get out there, get in the newsrooms, soak up everything you can so you can decide whether it's really for you. Don't have a one-track mind about what you're going to do. Everything I did during my degree and after has led me on a path I never expected. I was lucky enough to do the Western Sydney University exchange program. And it's during that program where I was still having my, oh my God, I don't want to be a journalist. What on earth am I going to do with my degree? So off I went to Canada. I was standing in the airport and it still cracks me up whenever I tell this story. I said to my mum, I can't do this, I don't want to go. I had been planning this trip for 18 months, all accommodation had been sorted, I had been accepted into the university I was going to, and I stood there as a 20 year old in Sydney airport saying, don't make me go. What, what was my mum supposed to say? She said, well, you're going, and she pushed me through the gate. As much as she didn't want me to go, I had to go, so off I went for six months and I had the time of my life. Being able to live overseas by myself, not have any parents around, how good is that? It's not an opportunity you have to pass by. I had the most amazing time exploring new cities, discovering new cultures, making lifelong friends and finishing off my degree. The irony is as soon as I got home I cried and said I didn't want to be back in Australia. I wanted to go straight back to Canada. <laughs> Safe to say my family did a collective eye roll and just carried on. While I was in the last few weeks of my exchange in Canada, I had a decision to make around what I was going to do for the next 12 months. I knew I didn't want to do journalism, but I had no idea what to do beyond then. So again, an email landed in Dr Chan's inbox asking for advice around what to do. She suggested an honours degree. I have to admit, it's not something I had ever considered but considering I do like to write, and I do like to write in long form, it made sense. The next step was putting in an application and deciding what my thesis subject was going to be. It was clear in my mind I had two choices, citizen journalism or the potential link between youth suicide and social media. I went with the latter. So off I went for the next 12 months, researching, doing assignments. At the time, I didn't realise what a commitment a th an honours thesis would be. Until I got to four weeks before my thesis was due, I had written about 3,000 words, and I was sitting in Dr Chan's office, looking and feeling frazzled, saying, I don't know what to do. So like a good mum and a good thesis supervisor, she said, put your head down and write and write and write. So that's what I did. And you know what? I got to the 20,000 words, and here I am. I managed to get that honours degree, all thanks to Dr Chand. A thesis is great, and it's set me up for what I wanted to do next, and that was to go to Europe, to celebrate the end of the thesis. <laughs> In between leaving for Europe and graduating, I applied for every graduate program there was on the market. Woolworths, BHP, publishing houses, 
Australian Federal Police. You name it, I applied for it. The Australian Federal Police graduate program was top of my list. It offered everything I wanted. It was, it was a proactive media team. It wasn't necessarily journalism per se, but it seemed right up my alley and somewhere where I could apply all of the skills I learned at Western Sydney University. I put in my applications. A few of them came back and they said no. So I thought, okay, that's all right. So off I went to Europe on my big trip for two and a half months. I was in Florence at some point in my trip when I got a phone call again from my poor mum. Have you seen the Transport for New South Wales graduate program? I said, I'm in the middle of Florence. I haven't seen anything, I'm really sorry. She said, I really think you should apply for it. I said, I don't have a laptop. Oh, like I'm on a Contiki, I don't want to do any of that. She's like, all right, so I'm gonna send you your resume, your covering letter, all of it. It is the phone call that changed my life and set me on my path. So off I went arriving in Athens, and the first thing I did was borrow a laptop from someone on my trip, sit there while everyone was at a rooftop party, and write my application for transport for New South Wales. I recently pulled the application out and had a look at it, and I'm just amazed that I even got through with a distracted mind doing that application. So off I went, did the application, continued on my trip, and got an email just as we landed in Dublin, telling me they wanted me to do psychometric testing. I thought, I am a psycho, I'm in Europe, and doing a job application. So off I went, trying to find another computer in a very unknown city, and I did my psychometric testing with my sister sitting behind me saying, we need to go to the pub. It's time to go to the pub. So I did the test. About two weeks later, they wanted me to do a video interview. I thought, oh my God, like I am still in Dublin. I have, I'm in the middle of European summer. I have no idea what professional looking clothing I have with me. So the group I was with was amazing. We pulled something together. I sat in the corner of the hotel room, recorded my video interview. I could hear the music thumping across the road. I was like, all right, let's just get this done. I want to go over there. So I did all of that, got on the plane to come home. As soon as I landed, I had two emails in my inbox. Transport for New South Wales wanted me to go for a group in-person interview. The Federal Police wanted me to go to Canberra to also do an in-person interview. As a going, as the saying goes, when it rains, it pours. So off I went to Canberra. AFP was top of the list for me. I was ecstatic to be there. I was ecstatic to be in their group interview. No matter how rigorous it was, it was an amazing experience. Once I finished that interview, we had to drive straight back to Sydney so I could go to the Transport for New South Wales interview. With those sort of interviews, you're put in a group of four and you have to go and build a Lego bridge and all of the associated planning that goes with it to make sure it doesn't fall down. I was put with three engineers. <laughs> what was I supposed to do? I thought, I am absolutely done for. Like, these engineers, they're going, they're going to be amazing. I'm not going to be chosen for this program. But lucky for me, they all started fighting in this group interview <laughs> about the best way to build this bridge. And I sat quietly to the side and did every other task we had to do. Because I now realise they weren't looking for the perfect bridge. They were looking for how you work in a team, how you communicate with each other, and remaining focused on the task. I didn't see those three engineers ever again. <laughs> I, and I was lucky enough to win a position in the AFP graduate program. I was the only one out of 2,000 people to be offered a position. I was then offered a role with the Transport for New South Wales graduate program as well. Poor Dr Chand. She got a call in October of 2014 with me saying, which one should I choose? Which one should I choose, Dr Chand? And she said, well, have you spoken to your mum? I said, <laughs> Yes, of course I have, but you were obviously my second call. So we went through the pros and cons, and at the time I was working part-time at Woolworths, I was standing in the cash office and I was supposed to be counting the safe at the time, but instead I was talking to Dr Chand about what my future was going to be. So together we weighed up the pros and cons of what each program offered. And it's safe to say I stayed with Transport for New South Wales. 
Transport for New South Wales is one of the most dynamic and exciting places I have ever worked. I was lucky enough to do four rotations over my two year program and got to work on projects like WestConnex, Sydney Light Rail, and various other transport infrastructure projects. Going into the WestConnex media team, fresh out of university, was one of the most overwhelming and exciting experiences of my life. My second week in the job, I had to organise a media event for Tony Abbott, who was the Prime Minister at the time, and Mike Baird, who was the Premier of New South Wales at the time, to do a sod turn for the first stage of the WestConnex project. At this time, there was a lot in the media about property acquisition, which is always a really tricky, a really tricky topic, and the cost of the project. So I was being thrown right in the deep end, and I absolutely loved every second of it. Having managers who gave me a helping hand along the way also helped. So by the time I got to the end of my graduate program, I was ready to go. I was then appointed as a senior media officer with Roads and Maritime Services, which has since been folded into Transport for New South Wales. And I felt like I became the expert on all things roads. I would come home and there would be a story that mentioned roads and I said, everyone, you need to be quiet because I think this is one of my stories. So I then got the nickname Miss Transport in my house and it stuck. Every time there's a story on the telly, I tell everyone to be quiet because I need to watch it and I need to then message all of my team to reflect on what that story said. One of the most exciting things I've been able to do with my career is join the COVID-19 task force. COVID-19 was a massive thing for the state government and a very unknown thing. Transport played a key role in that because we are a mass carrier. Uh, we were a mass carrier of more than 2.4 million trips a day. That's incredible. We've gone to about half of that now, but we had to establish a task force which brought in the best from the business to establish what we were going to do, how we were going to respond to this unprecedented event. I was lucky enough to be part of a team of four who led the media response to COVID-19 and transport. It was a massive undertaking. We were literally starting our communication and all associated materials from scratch. There was nothing to lean on in this case, whereas usually there was. We were doing a video a day to put out on social media to communicate what was happening on the network. We were putting out media releases every few days to indicate whether it was safe to be on public transport and who we wanted on public transport. We wanted everyone to free it up so we could have the nurses, the doctors, the police officers, the paramedics on public transport so they could support the rest of the community. Being a part of that team changed my life. It tested my crisis communication skills like nothing else. It was just simply amazing and I'll be forever grateful for being part of that team. I've since moved out of the media space and I'm now working in a corporate role with our chief of staff and our secretary of the department. So I've been lucky enough to go from strength to strength with Transport for New South Wales, and I couldn't be more grateful. When I was at Western Sydney University, I didn't feel like just a number at the university. I felt really connected to the, to the degree and the wonderful staff that came with it. I must echo Suzanne's sentiments. The staff that taught us were just incredible pushed us to take every opportunity and didn't let us look back for a second. So I would encourage you all to do the same. Don't say no to an opportunity. Even if you think it might be the wrong one for you, you don't know unless you try. The course I did definitely prepared me for the real world, but it took a couple of years before I realised how all of the skills I learned at university were going to apply to what I was going to do. I work hard, but this course definitely set me up for success. I want you to take away from everything that I'm saying that you should embrace your differences, try anything and everything available to you, and always keep an open mind. When I was at uni, I had absolutely no inkling that I would end up in the career I have. I'll be forever grateful to this institution and this degree. Thank you. I didn't really do much within the university because I didn't have time, to be honest. 
Um, but in terms of opportunities, I reached out to my local community radio station, to every single editor in the local newspaper around Western Sydney. I just, I hassled people over and over to give me an opportunity and offered to do work experience for free and do what Brogan did, come in and work and be a spare pair of hands and that really paid off for me in the end. I have to agree with Suzanne. I, one of the things I did within the university was the local loop program. Uh, I am not the best in public speaking. I'm not the best person on camera. But again, if you don't give it a go, you don't know what's going to happen. But like Suzanne, I also nagged the heck out of everyone. I just wanted my name everywhere. I wanted to be eager. And I think that's a key message there. Be eager, regardless of whether it's in the uni or out of the uni, you need to show that you're interested. I've had imposter syndrome since the beginning of my career and I still have it, to be honest. Um, but I talk about it openly because I, I think it's something that we all go through. I attended a lot of networking events and prioritised my studies. I worked night shift from 11pm to 7am, so during the day I could really focus on my degree and try and create opportunities. Um, I just, I turned up everywhere. I mean, I think it's just about prioritising your schedule and knowing what you want and not being afraid to go out and get it. I have to agree with that. Uh, the entire time I was at uni, I was working two jobs. So I was working about 35 hours a week. But you have to do what you have to do to get ahead. And similar with the imposter syndro syn um, syndrome, I can't believe people at work come to me for advice. Like, it's just, it's just shocking to me that I get an email and they say, so what do you think about this? And I'm like, oh, are you sure you want to know what I think about this? Like, it's very much, it's very much like that. And that never goes away. You just learn to get better at it. It's like fake it till you make it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I did all of the internships I did because if I didn't, I might still be stuck doing something I don't love. I don't have regrets but looking back my degree was really difficult and it was hard to be here um, there were many times that I wanted to give up and I almost did um, Barbara and Asha were so supportive and really helpful to me Barbara knew that I was struggling to get my assessment in on time and she said to me why don't you put um, all of your radio news stories together and send it in and I'll mark that as your assessment which was allowed um, things like that just got me through when I wanted to give up and didn't think I was going to make it to the end telling stories of people who are often overlooked and forgotten about from mainstream media. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to become a journalist. Um, so going out to diverse and marginalised communities and finding those stories and providing a voice and being able to bring an investigative aspect to it also, um, that's probably my, f yeah, that's the best part of my job. I think for me, it's seeing the tangible outcomes of my work. Um, so one of the classic examples is whenever we drive across a bridge that I have had a hand in promoting through my job as a senior media officer, everyone in the car claps because they know how passionate I am about it. They just love it. So every time, that's what I love. I just love that the infrastructure we're building is making a difference to communities. I think we all have a, world, a role to play in the world and no role is more important than the other. So I definitely think it's important. And you need to be passionate about what you do. And like I said before, my passion wasn't journalism and that's okay. I'm more passionate about transport and roads and building infrastructure. And I'm sure many people here wouldn't be interested in that, but that's okay. Yeah, I don't think that everybody needs to be a news journalist. I mean, there are so many other roles out there, entertainment journalism, that are just as important. I mean, we all know at the end of the day we want to switch off and watch some trashy television or read interviews with famous people. Um, I think there's absolutely a role in it. And if it's something that you're interested in, reach out to the people, the journalists who are writing articles in those papers 
or magazines or digital now. Reach out to the editor, pitch ideas. You know, do as much as you can to get your foot in the door. Um, before you reach out to sources, you need to research what it is that you're looking at. Every investigation that I approach, I start with a timeline and I do a newspaper search for the last 10 years and I go through every single article and write down potential contacts, I write down important information. So by the time I'm reaching out to those people, I know what I'm talking about. And it also allows you to come up with a strategy on how you're going to approach it because a lot of stories I do, they're stories that um, people don't want to go public with, that you know, they're not nice stories. They're, hard and difficult and so convincing somebody to go on camera to talk about their daughter who's gone over to Syria and living under ISIS is extremely difficult but the way I approached that was understanding where those families were coming from, understanding what they had already been through and also trying to I suppose get the motivation as to why a young woman or a young man would go to the Middle East and, and join a group like Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS. Um, so yeah, just research as much as possible and don't be afraid. Pick up the phone. You know, when we do stories, sometimes I call 100 people and two of them pick up and speak to me. We use social media. Find something that you can uh, relate to with that person and get them talking. Never pick up the phone and ask for something straight away because that's never going to work. Can I add one thing? And, it, and it's something that Suzanne's video package picked up on and mine, you need to be agile for your future. Social media wasn't such a big thing when we were at uni, so it's not something we really had to worry about. We were worrying about the traditional mediums like television, radio, print. That's sort of all been thrown out and social media has really been mixed into that because how many of you rely on Facebook and Twitter for news? Like some of you probably do and that's okay, but you need to realise that anything you're creating needs to also be created for the digital and social format, not just the traditional uh, mediums. So hi, my name's Rachel, I'm Acting Deputy Dean. I think that we should all join together and say a, a huge thank you to Suzanne and Rogan. I, I think today has been um, a real privilege for us to see so intimately into the lives of um, f um, our former students. And uh, when I was thinking about, you know, in wrapping up, on the face of it, Suzanne and Brogan have actually had very different um, lives and, and careers. Uh, Suzanne has overcome, you know, um, adversity and has been is a mum and has has shows a lot of um, um, investigative in um, depth in in her work, and Brogan has shown us what it's like to be a very very determined person who has also faltered occasionally along the way, but been able to pick up on opportunities. But when I was thinking about this just a moment ago and hearing you both speak, there's some you know huge similarities, and I'd like you to think about those similarities. Uh, there's a great deal of um, real hard work ethic in both of their stories. Um, I can hear in both their stories a lot of love and support from family, um, from family and from friends, and of course from um, the teaching staff at Western Sydney. And there's some really great words of advice and, and wisdom here about um, reflecting their own diversity in their work. And I think that's incredibly important for students at Western Sydney to actually be them, themselves. And we heard that so clearly with both Broger and Suzanne. And I also heard a lot about stepping outside the comfort zone and doing that little bit extra, that follow up um, from Suzanne's first um, contact with uh, ABC uh, um, looking for internships and, and Brogan for actually um, you know, <laughs> having to write that CV when she's um, on a holiday. It's that extra bit, you know, someone who doesn't quit, 
who's someone who doesn't give up. And that's what we heard, I think, from both of those stories. So I hope that you enjoyed um, hearing from them today. I know that we have done some fantastic backstories and some uh, video stories that you'll see uh, that Asher and Margot will show you in the future. And I'd like you to really listen to some of those stories because there's even more information that I think will be of huge benefit to you in your own studies. But I do really appreciate the, um, such incredible determination that you've both shown. And we really appreciate in your busy schedules for both of you to come here and share that with Western Sydney University students. So thank you very much.